So first off, for those of you that don't know, my name is Andy Culp, and I have the good fortune and privilege of serving as all of yours superintendent. Um, on behalf of the Board of Education, I want to thank you for making time in all of your busy schedules to be here tonight. I wanted to also just let all of you know that we will be filming this evening's presentation so that uh, anyone that's not able to be here can watch the presentation. We'll be posting on our website as well as all of the documents and PowerPoints that we'll be sharing tonight so that anyone that isn't able to be here can be. I uh, want to begin by sharing a couple uh, intended outcomes or goals. So the Board of Education has decided to engage Perkins Will and MKSK, Concord Addis, to engage our community in an iterative, collaborative process to do a master plan for our athletic complex, which is the footprint just north of Grandview Heights High School. So most of you probably think of it as the track, the football field, the soccer field. There also is a baseball field. There are the concession stands. The band uses it pretty regularly. Um, and that footprint is used heavily. Um, there are also a bunch of uh, out buildings, uh, training rooms, storage facilities, uh, et cetera. The goal here is to create an athletic plan. Uh, likely there might even be more than one, so a very good and a good, with corresponding costs associated in the end with that master plan based on this process. Step one in a facility process is to assess the current reality. So in essence, putting costs associated with our current facilities if we wanted to update them. So for example, um, our track right now is probably a year or two quite candidly past its lifespan and certain needs replaced. So putting a cost to what would it cost to replace the current track that we have? Uh, related to that, for example, would be we currently have a six-lane track. Would it be beneficial to do an eight-lane track? Almost all tracks are eight-lane. If you drive around and visit, pick a school, I would be surprised if any of them, quite frankly, even at middle schools, have a six-lane track. There's a cost to that also. So again, based on this process, uh, would we want to keep the six-lane track or potentially consider doing an eight-lane track? And what are the costs to doing that? So there is an example that may be an outcome to this process. Related to that, or step two, would be programming. So what does programming mean? Basically, programming, and th now these are my words. The architects might have a different definition, but I'm giving you my definition, and that is, how does current space meet or not meet what we are currently using it for? So examples might be uh, when that space was developed and created in 1938, what sports did we have versus what sports do we have now? And correspondingly, is there a gap between how we're using it today versus how it was built then and what are those gaps from a programming usage standpoint? And what might we be able to do to close those gaps? Are there better and more strategic ways to design that space so functionally it better serves and more efficiently supports our student athletes, not only for today, but for generations to come? I think it's important also to mention that uniquely in our community, the, the city of Grandview Heights allows for us reciprocally to use their space. So examples of that include McKinley Park. There are, I think, four tennis courts at McKinley Park that we have access to for both our middle school and high school girls and boys tennis program. Additionally, at McKinley Park, our middle school softball team uses that field. Buck Park. Buck Park, our middle school baseball team, plays there. Pierce Field, our high school softball team plays at Pierce Field. So one of the things that has occurred as a result of the survey that we did is we garnered feedback and some of the feedback was about city spaces. So I wanted to mention that uh, from the board's purview, my purview, 
we are able to control from a programmatic standpoint potential master plan and corresponding improvements on our footprint, not the city's. And I think of equal importance, we have a really amazing, wonderful relationship with the city of Grandview Heights. Uh, you know, the mayor, uh, Greta Kearns, was at our uh, four and a half hour programming session today, for example, and you know, we just have a really great relationship. And so I think just, just be mindful of that as we share today and, and get feedback from you. Currently, I think also there is no plan to be on the ballot for this master plan. Uh, so, you know, I, I think one of the things that the board and the leadership team have discussed is that quite candidly, in the absence of a master plan, we end up spending money backwards or unable to prioritize what expenditures or improvements we can make in the absence of a master plan or what makes the most sense to do incrementally or first or second. Uh, you know, for example, if we did do an eight, eight lane track, there are implications to that decision. If that was something that the community and this process want us to do. So the implications would be uh, home stands. The current home stands might impede our ability to do an eight lane track if we uh, retained that. Uh, additionally, um, you know, if ADA compliance is important, what are the costs to bring that stand, those stands up to speed? Um, the visiting stands also uh, could be a factor. Certainly there are cell towers and cell tower buildings that would impact our ability to do it. So there's a ripple effect even to some of these decisions. The last thing I wanted to mention is, and I think this is a fair question, um, and, and I, I think it's important to mention here, and that is uh, Stevenson Elementary. So three years ago-ish, we finalized a K-12 master plan for our K-12 facilities, including Stevenson. As I'm certain all of you know, we have, we successfully passed the bond levy to build the building that we're in now, 4-8, and comprehensively renovate the high school, leaving Stevenson deferred maintenance unaddressed. Um, so one of the things I wanted to mention is, is that we do have a master planning contract with Perkins Will to do that for Stevenson. We haven't actualized that, but what I wanted to mention is, is that is on our minds and it is something that we're thinking about. Um, and so I think importantly, I wanted everyone to understand that as well. Pretty much touched on all of that. So there is a decision-making framework that's important to understand. So the, the, the master plan workshop committee was uh, we had around 40 folks participate today in about four and a half hours of programming. That included coaches, community members, uh, administrators, our uh, architectural team, um, and that's uh, really important. And then we're also going to have community meetings to share with you all the outcomes of today's master planning committee, committee work and garner feedback from you. Uh, we also are going to incrementally have user group, groups and design teams and then we also have a core team, district team, that we meet with about every other week just to give updates and ask questions and make sure we're on pace with all of this. And ultimately all this information is going to funnel to the board and the board will make the final decisions ultimately. So did you know? I don't know if you all are able to see this because of the glare, but uh, what, what I wanted to show you is uh, this project, workers funded by the Depression Area Works Progress Administration Program are shown starting work on the athletic complex dedicated October 7, 1938. The inaugural game, Bobcats 25, Westerville 7. So I want to just orient you, these gates right here are still there. So if you were to walk out the front doors of the high school across the street, those are the same gates there. Um, this fence is still the same fence that's up there as well. Now the barbed wire has been taken down. I'm told it happened around 20 years ago-ish. Um, but it's really a fascinating, amazing picture uh, in, in time relative to what it is today versus what it was then. So kind of a, a cool picture 
But it also, I think, is informative in terms of this notion of when this athletic complex was built and who it was built for versus what it is that we're doing and how we're using it today. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Steve Church to introduce his team. I, I will just say, I've had the privilege now uh, over the last three years with both this Larson Middle School project as well as the high school project to meet and interact with a lot of different teams and architects. And uh, for my money, uh, Steve and his team are the finest that I've worked with. Uh, same with Doug Addis and the Concord Addis team. And I just feel really blessed and fortunate to have them as partners in this project and leading this master plan. So with that, I'll turn it over to Steve. Oh, and Rick Espy with MKSK. <laughs> Yeah, so <clears throat> thanks, Andy. Oh, do you want this? Good? Yeah. What I really want is this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, other members of our, our team that are here today, you're going to hear from both of them uh, Amy Ekman, Corey Nissenberg, and I'm at KSK this evening. Uh, Rick SB is here. Uh, Matt McGrath is with us all day today in our, in our workshop as well, as well as Doug Addis from Concord Addis and uh, Patrick Condren from Concord Addis. So, design team on the screen. Uh, owner's representative with Doug Addis and helping eventually to uh, derive some cost information about options that we start to develop as a part of the process. I'm not going to go into the, in, in any detail to this, but this is, we do have a detailed schedule mapped out for this. It includes the, the first master plan workshop that we did today. There's two more coming. Uh, probably easiest to five points since I can't use the, the, the laser on this. June 1st and July 19th. Importantly for folks that might be at this meeting today, those evenings of those dates will be same time, same place, at another community meeting for updates and, and sharing the progress of the master plan with you, okay? So that's really what we're doing tonight. We're gonna get sort of a, an abbreviated version of uh, what we did today. So those are the three, uh, three meetings. Today was really about trying to understand from the group, the constituents that were there, what were some, some principles, some guiding principles that should drive the master plan and against, when, against which any option that we develop should be evaluated. Uh, the other thing we did also was a big brainstorming session about what are some possible uh, programmatic needs for that camp. Now there's some things that are obvious probably football is over there now, it's going to stay there. Um, the turf field, the track, all those types of things. So really it's a big laundry list of things for the design team to consider and to come back with options to try to solve for those needs. As I mentioned, at each of these sessions, uh, upcoming now June 1st, uh, which is just a few weeks away, and July 19th, which is a little bit further out, there's gonna be a community meeting uh, and we'll be providing board updates as well as, as we progress through. Um, one of the things that's really, I think, important to talk about a little bit is just what a master plan is and perhaps what it's not. A master plan is really a large, uh, it'll be a large framework document that will help guide future decision making for that campus. It's not, it, what it's not is a set of construction documents that we give to a contractor to bid some work and actually go build something. It's really meant to guide. So Andy used a great example earlier of the track. The track is in need of replacement. There is, there is uh, some questions about should it, be, should it continue to be a six lane track or, or become an eight lane track. If you pulled the trigger today to resurface a six lane track and two years from now you decided really we should have an eight lane track, then you've sort of thrown good money uh, you know, uh, away and, and needing to tear that up and, and create an eight lane track. So <clears throat> it's really a judicial thing to do to understand where you're heading with that entire complex over there so that you make good, good fiscal uh, decisions. So there's a lot of uh, inputs into this. Uh, we got great inputs today to create a set of mass, uh, guiding principles which we're going to share with you uh, this evening and, and let you all take a look at those and, uh, and help edit those if we need to from a broader community perspective. But really, that's the lens through which we're going to be evaluating master plan options. It's a very important set of principles. Uh, in terms of the, the makeup of the master plan, 
Uh, Corey is going to talk a little bit this evening about an assessment that we did on the current facilities. That assessment is really geared toward understanding the condition, the physical condition of what is there now. So, and looking at, uh, does it need a new roof? <clears throat> uh, do we need to fix some stucco on the outside of a building? Uh, do we need to replace some restrooms? Uh, because they're just old and need a need replacement. What it's not trying to do is solve programmatic deficiencies. It's just looking at sort of baseline information, fixing what's there. It's an important uh, data point in the master plan process. <clears throat> but today we also looked at what are some programmatic objectives for that site. Those will start to become options that will then carry costs with those options. And it's always good, I think, to be able to evaluate the, any option against what's the baseline. If you just keep it the way it is, there's always a cost associated with that. Okay? There's no real no cost option, in other words. Uh, Concord Ash is going to be helping us with those budget analysis. And we will be presenting all that information back to the workshop community, the board, and, uh, and in, in these meetings as well. <clears throat> Ultimately, we will create a master plan coming out of that third workshop where the goal is to have an option or a couple of options for the board to consider, as Andy mentioned uh, in his opening remarks, and then it becomes the board's uh, uh, prerogative and purview to decide what advances forward. So one thing about a master plan is you don't necessarily have to do everything all at the same time. In other words, there's the overall plan, here's the vision. You don't have to do it all at the same time. What it allows you to do is take is, is approach it from an incremental standpoint. You can do a piece of it and wait a few years and do another piece and know that the money you've spent up front is good money. It's not, it's not going to be uh, jeopardized in future decisions. Or if the board elects to and decides to implement the entire thing at the same time, it, they can do that as well. But it's really a board decision. Okay. Um, for today, we're going to share a little bit about, again, a, a briefer presentation of what we did this morning. Uh, importantly, we thought uh, it was put in sort of the context of Grandview and some other things that are happening in the city. A number of years ago, the city launched a process called Civic Spaces and Places. And a plan, a framework plan was developed out of that. Uh, this is one of the graphics from that and <clears throat> the site we're talking about. It's this little tooth that sticks up out of the north end of Grandview, which really captures the athletic complex site. And the reason we're showing this is it was, it was identified through the city's process, uh, which wasn't, that wasn't just about the schools, obviously, because there's many sites uh, that are shown here as an important civic space within the community. It's a place where the community gathers, gathers around athletics, it gathers around uh, other community events, but it is an important uh, component. For the uh, within Grandview, <clears throat> within the school district, we now need to include Marble Club because it's a part of the district. So what's shown on the screen is the boundary of the school district and the parcels, uh, the property that are with uh, are under the school district's ownership and and the pieces that uh, where the district would dedicate some resources and 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 make some improvements if it wished to. So of course the high school middle school campus where we're sitting, the athletic complex north across uh, the street, and then Stevenson uh, uh, over to the east. And just some distances to those and some other pieces of, of property that are used uh, athletically by the school district. Uh, almost due south is McKinley Field where uh, uh, tennis is played. There's four tennis courts there, uh, middle school baseball. Buck Park, uh, it's also got middle school baseball. That's softball. This is softball, sorry. And then Pierce Field, which is softball, which sits just across the street from Stevenson. So uh, the, one of the great things about the community that Andy mentioned in his remarks is that, um, that, that the city graciously uh, allows for the school district to use these, uh, these pieces of property. So it's really an important part of the athletic programs for the, the, the school district. Uh, just a couple of aerial images. Uh, I'm sure you've all, probably all been there and familiar with, familiar with this, but we're looking um, sort of south across the, the uh, athletic complex to uh, the high school building. Uh, Fifth Avenue is in the foreground here. 
And then sort of looking uh, from the other end, uh, high schools over here on the right, kind of looking uh, north, northeast. Uh, if you kept looking off into the distance, you'd probably see the, the horseshoe, right? Uh, it's it's gen in that general direction. Um, I won't spend any time uh, sort of going through this, but this is just something, a graphic that we put together for our, our work session today, really just to identify all the components that are on that site. And, you know, we ended up with a double A, the victory bell, so there's, you know, we've got every letter of the alphabet and plus a, plus a double A. So there's quite a few things on the site that uh, you might not actually be aware of, you know, all sorts of things with uh, track and field events, so a long jump and pole vault. But baseball and the sorts of associated dugouts, dugouts, I'm sorry, on the far north end of the site. Um, so quite a few things that take place uh, on this campus. And it gets an awful lot of use. Uh, this is the, uh, the, the types of uses and the seasons during which those uses happen sort of mapped out on the field. So in this general vicinity, uh, fall, winter, and spring, fall there's an awful lot of things happening the same same thing is true in the spring but soccer football band flag football cross country uh, community used to you know sort of walking and running around uh, the track there's things that happen off-site uh, don't want to forget about those and then the upper field is a similar graph uh, for that and then there's other activities other outside um, uh, folks that come in powder powder puff football there's police training that happens on this site uh, uh, you may not know but that does occur, and uh, some other outside uses uh, for the site. So it's heavily used. Uh, I don't think I've ever been over there where I haven't seen somebody at least walking around or jogging a community member uh, around the track. Um, a little bit about uh, what's happening topographically on the site. Uh, the, the turf field is uh, sitting about an elevation above sea level, uh, 795. As you head north, you're going uphill, right? There's a berm that happens right through here. Uh, in fact, the, the field where the baseball diamond is called the upper field for that reason. Uh, and that's just where the berm is. Uh, just a few dimensional uh, things about the baseball field. And uh, one thing I wanted to talk about uh, briefly here is in 2017, uh, a, uh, a committee was formed to look at that complex and provide some input and some recommendations. Uh, there's a number of things that they, that they decided uh, that uh, should be looked at from Title IX issues to sort of the open door policy for the site and the community use of the site. Uh, ADA issues, or, or there's any number of ADA, issues, ADA American with, Americans with Disability issues uh, across the site. Um, there are some other things that they talked about, like uh, you may have seen the cell tower providers, uh, the cell service providers that are on three of the four light poles. They've got, also got equipment on the ground uh, that is not always in the best place in terms of uh, some master plan options, so that's something that we'll be looking at uh, in, uh, in the future. And then there was also a list of recommendations, uh, sort of things about uh, resolving the Title IX issues. If you don't know what Title IX is, it is a uh, law that was enacted that said you have to provide equal access. So if you have uh, boys baseball, you need to have girls softball. You need to provide equal opportunity. And so the, the locker rooms, for instance, are a good example of an issue with Title IX because of just boys locker rooms below the, the existing uh, home site uh, stadium. Uh, but again, there, I'm not going to read all these, but there's a, a list of 14 uh, recommendations that came out of that report, which I'm assuming is available um, uh, through the district if you want to see the entire report. It's, it's uh, five or six pages, pretty easy for you. But you know, included things like fixing the locker rooms, solving Tile 9, dealing with ADA, uh, replacing, uh, it's had the, uh, a track replacement, consider eight lanes, uh, look at the possibility of putting turf, uh, artificial turf on the upper fields to get better use out of those. So, any number of things, and all, and all of these things actually got talked about in our workshop today. There's, there's also at the same time, the district has continued to make improvements and investments in the athletic complex. Again, I'm not gonna read all of these, but many things have been done. For instance, there, a turf, the turf was replaced back in 2017. I'm looking for Brad. Yeah, yeah, Brad. yeah 2017. 
So quite an investment, actually, to replace the turf. Uh, that was done. Uh, so any number of things, either on this site or on some of the other sites where athletics are happening, like uh, you know, new concessions at Pierce Field, for instance. Uh, Andy alluded to this earlier, um, but things have changed dramatically since the time that these facilities were built. Um, this is, for instance, a pretty typical list of athletics that would have been offered here in Grandview in the mid-1950s. And what you won't see there is girls, any sport, any, you know, at all, right? As opposed to now, this is what's happening here now. And so there's a real big disc and this is true across the country, right? With, with facilities that are this age, they weren't designed for equal access and parity between uh, boys and girls athletics, which they have to be now. Right, so it's it's one of those. It's one of the. It'll be one of the big drivers we think in the master plan is providing equity of access. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we uh, we've had Corey come on up. Uh, Corey's going to share some uh, the assessment findings with you. Um, but we did have uh, architects, all sorts of engineers, electrical, mechanical, plumbing, structural. MKSK was there from a landscape architecture perspective, the civil engineer, all walked through, all provided assessments of that site. And Corey's gonna run just sort of briefly through, sort of high level of some of the findings for that. And then Amy is gonna share some, we launched a community survey, I don't know if anybody in the room answered the community survey. We'll share some results out of that. So great, I'm glad you, glad to see some hands come up. And then we'll probably wrap it up for the Thanks, Steve. So what have we done so far? Steve alluded to it. We've put together an assessment that basically was an observation of what is on the site currently. So we walked around engineers, uh, architects, landscape architects, and took a look at the facilities that are there today, the spaces that are there today, and tried to understand not what would what it would be like to add things to the site, but really about what's there. What needs to be done to the facilities today if everything was to maintain and just be brought up to the standards that it should be. Uh, we just, we walked through the site, we walked through all the different buildings, and I'll follow up here with photos of several of these spaces, some of which you may be very familiar with, and some spaces you may have never gone into, uh, such as like some of the concession spaces or the press box. The intent of doing this uh, assessment was to understand what is the cost implication of keeping everything as is and bringing it up to code and standards today. There is a cost associated with essentially uh, doing nothing or not adding anything to the site. The buildings have to be maintained, the site has to be maintained, and in many cases, older facilities will need more cost and more maintenance uh, than a newer facility on the site. So there is a cost associated with that, and we are trying to understand what that would be to inform decisions that we can make moving forward. So looking at the home side bleachers and the stadium, uh, you guys are very, probably very familiar with this from football games, uh, the stands and the space behind the stands. This, this area, not a very accessible space, uh, a tight, narrow hallway, but this is how you get to the bathrooms behind the stadium, and is something that uh, we need to look at is accessibility around the site. On the right here, you'll see images of the press box. So you can tell it's, it's not a very finished space, uh, a lot of raw wood and, and kind of rough finishes within the space. These are the types of spaces that we want to show you if you have not been within them. So speaking of accessibility, there are many challenges on the site currently with accessibility. The home side bleachers are, do not provide an accessible way for somebody in a wheelchair to sit within the stands. A pretty uh, big problem with the bleachers currently. And you'll see the same issue with the visitor side bleachers. Also, the one accessible toilet which is brought to site, which is the porta potty, doesn't have an accessible walkway to get to it. 
So a bit of a challenge there as well. And then you'll see the gate from the parking lot, which also does not have a ramp in any way. In addition to accessibility, looking at the entryways and the front entry gate, as well as the other access gates to get onto the site and how you get around the site as well. The locker rooms, many of you may have not been within the locker rooms. Uh, here's some images of what they look like. And you'll see some really raw spaces such as the, the showers and the toilet rooms, which are uh, currently in this, in this condition. So just want to bring these photos, show people what it looks like within these spaces. Here's some more general photos of the site. And one thing that Andy brought up at the beginning is a uh, comment about the track. You'll notice uh, this is just one image of some cracking within the track, but it also extends down into the, the subsurface of the track. And it's not the only condition within the site. There are others like this. Uh, and these are the things that may inform decisions that uh, are made as this process continues to move forward. And then there's also the other uh, field events within the space. The concessions buildings, there's three of them on the site. There's the home concessions, and you'll see photos of the outside of the building here on the left, but also the inside of the building. It's a very tight space with everything that's in there, that everything that um, the school has wanted to provide. And it really, um, the current building does not necessarily fit everything that's within it at the moment. You'll see the visitor's concession on the top right and the uh, concession for baseball on the bottom. Here are some general photos of baseball. We've talked about this um, quite a bit today at our, at our workshop as well. Um, some of the things that got brought up, for example, are the temporary fence for the outfield of the baseball, uh, baseball field. It's a, it's a concern for many of the safety of this, this fence. And, um, you know, what does that mean for, for the rest of the site? You'll see pictures of the dugouts and also the bleachers as well um, as the backstop for the baseball diamond. And just to reiterate this as well, there are other sites that are being used by the school. And Andy mentioned these and Steve briefly as well. Uh, Buck Park, Pierce Field, and McKinley Park, which are not um, on site, but are spaces that many teams use from the school. So to give you a glimpse of what we're, what we're looking at, these are uh, two images of what we have produced for, our, for the assessment. What we've tried to do, as I mentioned, is basically provide observations and, and identify the condition that these spaces are in. And we've broken it down into a much uh, greater level of detail than we're kind of uh, diving into today. So on, you know, for example, one of the buildings, the concessions building, we identified uh, the condition of the roof, the structure, the general finishes within the building, the accessibility, uh, the doors, the furnishing. So we dive into uh, a, a much greater level of detail to really look at what these facilities uh, look like today and what cost implications there would be in maintaining or um, upgrading these facilities. And um, in addition, it's not just the buildings on the site, but there's also the different site elements. So the, the South Gateway, for example, and the uh, accessibility of it, the track that we've mentioned, um, the parking lot, the turf field. And we identified these with a rating system of, of one to three. One being satisfactory, doesn't need any work today. Three being it needs uh, immediate attention to bring up to uh, current standards. And just another way to look at this, uh, similar way we broke down these spaces, these buildings and uh, areas on the site, is what kind of uh, attention does it need? Does it need an immediate attention within the next five years? Does it maybe not need to be, uh, there's nothing that needs to be done today, but within five to 10 years, there's gonna be more maintenance that's going to be required, or moving forward 10 plus years, maybe it's something that down the line uh, will need attention, but for right now, 
it's, it's, uh, it's doing well on the site for what the school needs it for. So these are just some uh, general graphics and what you'll see is there is quite a bit of things that were identified as immediate needs and uh, you'll see you see that in the red from both uh, this first slide as well as the second slide um, but with the same uh, on the other hand there are things such as uh, baseball storage or the bleachers at the baseball fields that are in really good shape and are um, great to maintain and, and can keep performing well as they are and just one more look at uh, that same kind of red, yellow, green diagram of what on site is doing the job that it needs to be doing and what are the things that need some more immediate attention. So you can see that a little bit uh, in another level of detail with some of the red areas like the track on site, some of the uh, buildings that need a little bit of attention in some areas but are good in others. So another way to look at so I will pass this off to Amy Ekman to talk about the survey results. Okay, let's look at some graphs and charts. Seven o'clock at night, a lot of numbers. Who's excited? <laughs> um, we got a ton of responses, surveys that, that was sent out to community members, parents, students, etc. More than half of the respondents, which is over 500 people, were parents that responded. About a quarter were students, and the rest were made up of faculty, staff, coaches, community members, alumni, etc. So we thought that was a pretty huge response, and this is something that we can continue to do as we move through this process to kind of understand the pulse of, of what's happening in the community broader than the, who might show up at these meetings. Um, tons of information on this slide, so I'm going to try to break it down for you a little bit. The top part is really just the detailed graph. Um, we asked five questions. The first one was, who are you? The parent question. This one is, how satisfied are you with the current conditions of these various areas? And this is gonna show up on a couple of slides. Um, the purple, the dark purple is not satisfied. Moving to somewhat satisfied, then neutral for the pink. Satisfied, very satisfied, or don't know. Which is that lime green color. So what we try to do to make this a little easier to read is aggregate um, the somewhat and the not satisfied, which is kind of this pink purple, the thumbs down, and the satisfied, very satisfied. So these will not add up to 100 in any case, but that just gives you a sense of what the people are least satisfied with the most, and this is kind of the same theme you'll see over and over here. So the turf field, most people thought was in pretty good shape, um, which it is. Um, you can see that 70%. There's things like the entry that got a pretty negative response. If it was predominantly not satisfied, it's that darker purple color. If it was predominantly somewhat satisfied, it's the pink. Nobody was very satisfied. That's what we learned. <laughs> Nobody was in the green for, for the majority of the answers. Um, so there's there's very common themes that you hear across from what Corey said, what Amy said, what Steve said, you'll see in these survey results. Um, this one we thought was pretty funny. The restrooms are literally off the page with this, with this not satisfied. 75% um, in aggregate thought those needed attention. You saw those, those pictures, and probably all of us can agree to that. Um, and again, we can make this all available to you after this um, in PDF format so you can dive in a little deeper if you want. Um, things that people were a little bit more happy with was offsite like tennis and softball, really happy with those facilities, um, and uh, home concessions, things like that were, were fairly well liked. Um, we asked for priorities, just understanding, again, conditions versus priorities. Um, so we see uh, highest priority is this kind of salmon color, the lowest, uh, the purple. So the low priority, again, makes sense, the turf field are in good shape. Um, highest priority, home bleachers, visitor bleachers, locker rooms, um, all rows to the top. Again, priorities on the next page, we have asked this a few times. Um, it looks like we've got not, not a ton, except for, again, those restrooms are off the chart on this. Um, and you can kind of see those aligning with the conditions, actually, which is great. Um, this is a little bit more of the um, intangibles about the site, the, the not physical things like a field versus aesthetic image. 
So we ask the same questions. Um, how, how satisfied are you? And then what are your priorities? So, so aesthetic image, actually people are pretty unhappy. More than half of the people responded um, that the, that was something that they did not like so much. Same with access and circulation, which we heard accessibility and equitable facilities. These are again, themes you're just gonna continue to hear um, over and over. So um, priorities again are in alignment with that. Equitable facilities, um, safety and security, access and circulation and accessibility. So all of these are very logical in their answers. So what we did today, after all of you saw a snippet, um, we did some uh, work with our small groups throughout the day, probably an hour and a half. Uh, one of their tasks was coming up with guiding principles for the process. And those are what you see here. There's five that rose to the top with a few subsets. And um, I'll go through those, but one thing we want to ask you to do is for your feedback on what you think of these. Is there anything missing? Is there anything you disagree with? Um, we'll, we'll hand these out to you at your tables and you can give us that feedback. It sounds like many of you already did the online survey, so we also have another, another survey that's online. It's the same question, so if you've already done it, this will be your main task tonight. Um, but these again align, and these are going to be the things that we will make decisions that will help make decisions and prioritizing through the master plan. Inclusivity and equity, which includes accessibility and Title IX issues across everything. Safety and security, um, that was both physical space, meaning security cameras, et cetera, and as well as just pers feeling personally safe. Um, and, and having some guidelines for public use to make sure that the space is being utilized in a way that respects all the users. Um, this came up a number of times, we kind of plugged it all in one, but really efficiency, functionality, utility, performance, and really multi-use, the fact that things can change over time. We already know the baseball field, the reason there's that temporary fence is because the outfield is used for band practice, for soccer, for all kinds of other things. It's already multi-use, but really taking that to the next level. Um, aesthetics, pride, welcoming, uh, the right signage and wayfind, know where, knowing where you're gonna go. Uh, really good conversation today about spectator experience. So not just about, um, a lot of it was about the social experience and having places to have those, that camaraderie while you're at these events. And a lot of it was about the functionality of it. How well can you see your son playing soccer? So um, the other thing that came up along the pride and welcoming and aesthetics is keeping the Grandview um, tradition. So the two things that rose to the top there were the gate and the bell somehow if those can be kept, even if they're not kept in their same location, just to um, honor the history of, of the site. Um, the last one was quality over quantity. So again, with master plan being a roadmap and maybe not being able to do everything at once, that quality and putting in place the right pieces at the right time um, within the budget that you have, making it maintainable and sustainable. Those are pretty, pretty awesome, we thought, common threads that came up. So, Great meeting today, and we hope that you'll provide us your feedback on these things. Um, there is um, upcoming, there'll be some site tours if you want to see those toilets in person, you can do it. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's pleasing as that seems. Um, those dates are to be determined, but that, that'll give the, the community an opportunity to see firsthand what's out there. Um, we hope we'll get your feedback today, and future meetings will also allow for feedback. And we'll, we'll meet again on June 1st with the next um, part of the process. Uh, I believe the meeting will also be here. So really the presentation part right on time is done and we're just looking for your feedback. This survey QR code is again, um, some of those same questions that we asked on the online survey, you're still welcome to do it. We have hard copies here, but if you've already done it, um, you don't have to. So any questions, we're otherwise good to go. That's it. Yeah, hi. hi um he might need you to talk about this. Just wondering if you could add a little bit more flavor around, um, it looked like there was a high priority in the surveys around the equity piece. Yes. And I think you could read that in many different ways, different sports, boys, girls, access, ages, and do you have a, a better sense of, of what all is included in that? Yeah, we, we also asked an open-ended question in the survey at the, at the end, which we, really was in alignment with what the answers were, but a lot of it had to do with um, 
women's sports should have the same types of facilities as, as men's. Huge, huge amount in those comment sections. Um, some comments about even the off-site facilities, but they're in great they're in great shape. So um, Title Nine and Andy can explain this better than I can. Do you want to talk about well, it? I feel like it's yeah, a good. Yeah, I, I think that, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, and really, really kind of gets at the heart of one of the core reasons why the board wanted us to do this. But I think probably the best example, uh, well, best is a loaded, but w one of the really good examples would be locker rooms. And so currently there are two locker rooms, in essence, a home football locker room and a visiting football locker room that are used sparingly by anyone else. And so would it make sense as part of this to address that in a more egalitarian way such that instead of there being two locker rooms, maybe there's four. Um, so that seasonally all sports, men's and women's, have uh, access to a locker room, all stop. Um, so that's, I think, a really tangible example that we can all visualize and understand. I think uh, to, to go maybe a little further down that rabbit hole, uh, to give you another example would be coaches' offices on that site. Who, who currently has an office and who doesn't? And so are there, is there a gap there and could we improve upon that? Um, so I think those are two quick tangible examples that address or answer, hopefully, your question. Yes. Would you like the microphone? <laughs> I'll take it. Um, I was wondering if you guys could address even issues with the track. There's been a lot of talk of it's out of shape. But do we, has there ever, does everyone realize that it's actually in the wrong direction? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and also just the idea of looking at track as a sport that I believe there's over 60 high schoolers that participate in track and about the same number of middle schoolers and how much that really does affect that female side. And then when there is bad weather or anything like that, they're walking into a storage unit for safety. Um, so yeah, there's so, all those. So, yep, Thank great you. point. Um, so all of that was ex discussed ex extensively and we even got into, I mean, not great detail of solutions, but we began to talk about solutions for both um, needing to replace the track, but also reorienting the track such that it's uh, highly functional, which it isn't right now. And then additionally, we even talked about, in a general way, um, we didn't get into the solutions to this, but it was talked about like, um, whether it's a shelter house or you know a covered outdoor space that provides protection, um, certainly for track, but also for any other team that's using it. Yeah, so we, we actually discussed both those things. More locker rooms would help with that. Yeah, more locker rooms would also help with that as well. Um, just the importance of if we are able to do an eight person track and can do um, the the fully automated timing system, we could actually host events. We'd have a lot more students that would have the opportunity to advance and qualify, which currently they don't. Yeah. So, and so we have a lot of success that, there. Right, just add color to what she's saying for everyone else's edification. The, the finish lines are not um, uh, equal or congruent. So correspondingly, you can't use an automated timer system, which is pretty standard today. Um, quite candidly, but we're not able to use it. So that's a problem. So certainly we, we, we did discuss solutions to that. But, but in addition to your point, um, having a six lane track is additionally prohibitive from hosting larger meets because you're limited in the number of people that can run at once. So it's both things that we would like to fix or certainly evaluate mm -hmm. and have get community feedback on that is a priority to consider a master plan that would include addressing all of that holistically. Yeah, the other task today, the other task today, and we couldn't actually aggregate it fast enough because it was off the slide. There were so many programmatic elements. We asked for those programmatic elements.
sense. So that you'll see distilled next time into all of the things that make sense to be added or um, embellished on the site. And the track came up a number of times. And, and about a hundred other things. And, so. I, and I will say, uh, you know, specific, specific to that task that we were asked to do, um, there was, uh, it was even for me, who is very familiar with that space, surprising at the passion and ideas um, that was were exhibited by everyone. Uh, additionally, the common threads, because we did it in four different groups, but there were clear themes about what needed to be addressed. So, using track, since clearly that's a passion of yours, which is a good thing, that was everything you said, literally, was a common theme independently done in all four groups. Just for example. So, eight lane track, reoriented the uh, finish line so it's consistent, um, and wholesale replacement. So, that, and again, that was independently, all four groups felt strongly about that. But what I'm also sharing with you is, is there are a lot of other ideas <laughs> that people are passionate about. Um, and that's just a question of looking at how much, how many applicants are that? Yeah. Because this is the only sport that we can officially do things properly. I mean, baseball, softball. You make it to first base, it's the same amount everywhere, but ours is not set up properly. So, and then also, I'm going to make one other comment of um, how to help the spaces that are practice areas that our kids, I mean, it is so uneven and unsafe where they are kind of getting shoved off to to practice, how to make that safer. And then even like cheerleaders have to go out there and practice. I mean, there's so many different sports and Great, great, great feedback. Does everyone have one of these? But you're more than welcome. Other questions? Well, I'll conclude with all of the, this slide deck, uh, this video, along with the outcomes of today's master planning committee will all be posted online. There'll be an email sent to the community that will include a link to our facility planning page um, that will create maybe a new heading and tab for you know k-12 athletic master planning so that if uh, to include the survey so on and so forth so uh, all of this will be available not only for all of you here today but for anyone that wants to do a deep dive so on behalf of the board of education and our uh, entire architectural team thank you so much for coming tonight and uh, hope you get to enjoy this beautiful weather that we're having today. Yeah. I'm going to. <laughs>